The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's what my prayer book tells me this morning in the Psalms. Good morning, welcome back. How can fear be a good basis for our understanding? It's a phrase, the fear of the Lord, or being God-fearing, which has passed down through the centuries in our culture and very much formed the way we've inquired about the world, scientifically, artistically. But it's one whose credence now has all but evaporated, partly, I think, because it's, it, it's misunderstood, but it jars with the nature of our times, which emphasises our own agency but of course, all great thinkers, uh, explorers, uh, researchers have, whether they believe in God or not, an appropriate sense of, of modesty and awe before all that they uh, are living in the midst of, before the sometimes terrifying power of the natural world, for example, or the vastness of space. and. Uh, Understood rightly, I think, the, the fear of the Lord is a grounded sense of our own limitation. A grounded sense of our own limitation. Now, as, as you know, because we've spoken about it in these days, I've been dipping in to the early chroniclers of, of our national life in recent weeks, Bede and Gildas and so on. And uh, each one of these writes their story of the country as if they were writing the book of chronicles or kings in the bible in in the sense that they they use the the god-fearingness uh of the uh each leader to be a kind of yardstick for assessing their efficacy the the, the goodness of of their their reign um and uh, today I've been looking at Henry of Huntingdon, who's writing in the 12th century and writes uh, uh, the history of the late Saxon and early Norman kings. He's the one who gave us the tale of Henry I dying of a surfeit of lampreys, if you remember that, that wonderful phrase. Um, but I'm thinking today about King Canute, who I've got a personal interest in because one of my forebears as Bishop of Ramsbury, St. Bertwald of Ramsbury, in the 11th century, he uh, he was meant to be a close advisor of King Canute, and uh, I imagine him holding Canute's towel or looking after his sandals on the seashore as Canute tried to stop the waves from coming in, because really that's one of the only things that we know about Canute or believe about him. And it's assumed to be, of course, a, a, a cautionary tale of overstepping your... Uh, own authority and of rulers doing that in particular a kind of of our own human hubris uh, but it may not be actually and Canute uh, it one another way of looking at it is of course that that Canute was telling those who thought that he had limitless power that you that he really didn't a demonstration of his own limitation and uh, this is what Henry of Huntingdon writes about him. And Canute, when Canute was at the height of his ascendancy, he ordered his chair to be placed on the seashore as the tide was coming in. Then he said to the rising tide, you are subject to me as the land on which I am sitting is mine, and no one has resisted my overlordship with impunity. I command you therefore, Sorry, turning the page. Not to rise on my land, nor to presume to wet the clothing or limbs of your master. And this is lovely, because it says, next. But the sea came up as usual, <laughs> and disrespectfully drenched the king's feet and shins. How dare it? So jumping back, the king cried, let all the world know that the power of kings is empty and worthless. There is no king worthy of the name, save him by whose will heaven, earth and sea obey natural, eternal laws, rather. Thereafter, King Canute never wore the golden crown, we read, but placed it on the image of the crucified Lord in eternal praise of God the great King, by whose mercy may the soul of King Canute enjoy rest. 
Fascinating. So it seems as if this episode on the seashore was a turning point for Canute, where he recognised, realised uh, what was beyond him. And the good rulers both uh, step into their own responsibility. They don't avoid it or, or vacillate like Ethelred the Unready. They do all that they can, but they don't overstep that mark. Uh, they remain humble before God and recognise what is God's authority and what is theirs. That is a balance, it seems to me, that is well worth each of us learning. It's a good model for leadership today. How do you find that balance between stepping into uh, what is before you, but not going beyond it? Uh, that's a, a good challenge. Good challenge in the spiritual life and personally too. Not to, to recognise our own limitation. My dear late mother used to say to me when talking about prayer, pray as you can, not as you can't. Uh, simple, plain advice, but which I've returned to again and again. Don't attempt what is beyond you, but do do what is before you, that you can. God bless you today as you go to ground.